Welcome back to Horrifying Stories. August 28, 2003 started just like any other banking day at PNC Bank in Erie, Pennsylvania. However, things began to change in the afternoon when a 46-year-old man stepped inside the bank with a walking cane on one hand and a note on the other. He approached the bank teller and handed her the note. Her disposition suddenly turned to terror when she read the words written on the note. On the paper were instructions to gather bank employees with access to the vault and fill the bag with 250,000 US dollars. Under his shirt, the man in front of her had a bomb tied around his neck. This was their horrifying story. Viewer discretion is advised. It was around 2.28 in the afternoon, trembling with fear, the bank teller approached her branch manager and handed the note. The note said the bank only had 15 minutes to act, so they needed to act fast. However, they had one big problem. At least two authorized bank employees needed to access the vault together in order to successfully open it, and it was only the branch manager that was around that afternoon. In spite of the serious threat and knowing their lives were at stake, the branch manager instructed the teller to stay calm and get as much money as she can from what's available in the drawers. The teller told the man that they couldn't access the vault at the moment, but she filled the bag with $8,702 and handed it over to the man, hoping it would be enough for him to leave. The man took it and slowly walked out of the bank, went back to his car and drove away. The incident was immediately reported to authorities and not long after, first responders caught up with Wells 15 minutes later. With no time to waste, police surrounded him and arrested him at once. The bank robber was identified to be Brian Douglas Wells, a pizza delivery guy who claimed he was just also a victim to three black men who ordered pizza from their shop. He recounted to authorities that he was just delivering their order at the given address when the men suddenly took hold of him and strapped the bomb around his neck. Allegedly, the men handed him the cane, which was actually a shotgun disguised as a cane, and the note which contained the instructions on how to carry the crime he was forced to commit, to rob the bank and bring with him $250,000 in cash. Not long after, media outlets came and positioned cameras at a distance from the cordoned off area. The scene was broadcasted live as Wells tried to convince authorities that he was telling the truth. He tried telling them again and again that the bomb was real and that it was really going to go off if they didn't send bomb experts to the site at once. The police sought the help of bomb experts but response time was quite long. Kneeling on the road handcuffed, Wells can be seen frustrated and panicking as the bomb begins to tick louder and faster. The bomb squad came, but it was three minutes too late. The bomb had already gone off, sending him to the ground and leaving a big hole on his chest. It was a horrific scene that was caught on camera from different angles by the media who were live at the scene. Wells was now dead. Now, police immediately shifted their attention to finding out if Wells' claims were true. They searched his car and found the handwritten notes that contained detailed instructions on which bank to rob, its address, and the subsequent instructions on what to do next to unlock and disable the bomb Wells was wearing. They had also found the shotgun disguised as a walking cane. All these coincided with the story Wells had been recounting to police minutes earlier. One of the notes indicated another location, which the police believed to have been the latest hint obtained by Wells. When they went to the location, not a single hint had been found. This made investigators presume that they're being monitored by the masterminds of this crime. Upon thorough investigation, authorities found out that even if Wells had been able to get to the final hint, and managed to gather the keys to the four locks and the code combination, the explosive Wells was wearing was impossible to ever be safely disabled and removed. More than two weeks later on September 20, 2003, a man named Bill Rothstein called 911 to report that he had a dead man's body inside the freezer in his garage. The dead man was identified to be James Roden, the current boyfriend of Rothstein's ex-fiancée Marjorie Deal Armstrong. Coincidentally, Rothstein also lived close to where Wells was last seen working. Although aside from that, there has been no other information that linked him directly to Wells. 
Rothstein confessed to the police that he had helped Deal Armstrong cover up for the murder which was why Roden's body was within the premises of his house. The following day, on September 21st, a case was filed against Deal Armstrong for the death of Roden who was believed to be shot and killed at her house in East 7th Street, Erie, Pennsylvania. After killing him, with the help of Rothstein, they transported it to his house in Upper Peach Street, Summit Township near Erie and placed the body inside the freezer. This was not the first time that deaths have been linked to her. Back in 1984, Deal Armstrong already had a previous case of killing her boyfriend during that time, Robert Thomas. She had also shot him, leading to his death but was acquitted from the case asserting that it was out of self-defense. In 1992, her then-husband, Richard Armstrong also died due to brain hemorrhage. She filed a case against the hospital for malpractice and won. Now, Deal Armstrong was known by many to be a smart woman. She graduated valedictorian in high school and earned herself a master's degree. However, she suffers from bipolar disorder. In January of 2005, she pleaded guilty to the murder of Roden by reason of insanity and was sentenced to 20 years in prison. Then, around July 2005, the unexpected plot twist unfolded. Deal Armstrong admitted that she killed Roden because he knew about Wells' case, their plan to rob the bank and threatened to report to the police. She claimed that Rothstein, who tragically died of cancer a year prior, was the mastermind of the bank robbery and of Wells' death. She also alleged that Wells was in fact part of the planning but tried to back out when he realized he was to be the one with the bomb. She confessed she didn't divulge much information at first because she knew speaking about Roden's death in detail would also eventually implicate her in Wells' death. She had hoped her speaking up would grant her a reduction in her sentence. In the same year, yet another character entered the already complicated story behind the infamous bank robbery. A man named Kenneth Barnes was surrendered by his brother-in-law to authorities, as the man had been bragging about his involvement in the bank robbery case. Immediately, a link between Barnes and Deal Armstrong had been identified and confirmed. Barnes was her fishing buddy. He claimed that before the robbery, Deal Armstrong attempted to hire him to kill her own father because she believed he was rich. He pointed at Deal Armstrong as the brains behind the carefully crafted crime. Apparently, it was Barnes who made the pipe bomb and the late Rothstein made the collar bomb, upon the instruction of Deal Armstrong. In exchange for a shorter sentence, Barnes agreed to testify against Deal Armstrong. Since then, the investigation has been a constant exchange opposing claims and a consistent blame game. However, trials for Deal Armstrong was put to a halt in July 2008, nearly five years since the incident, as the judge deemed her unfit for trial due to her bipolar disorder. She was instead subjected to further assessment and treatment while in prison. By September 2008, Barnes pleaded guilty to conspiring in the armed robbery and to the use of destructive devices. He was sentenced to 45 years in federal prison. More than a year later, in September of 2009, trials resumed for Deal Armstrong. In early 2010, she underwent a surgery to remove a cancerous lump in her neck and was eventually diagnosed with glandular cancer that has actually spread from one of her breasts. Despite being given only three to seven years left to live, trials continued, and so on November 1, 2010, the jury found her guilty of all the charges filed against her, including armed bank robbery, conspiracy, and the use of destructive devices. She was given a life sentence and an additional 30 years, without the possibility of parole. Because of his testimony against Deal Armstrong, Barnes earned for himself a shorter sentence in 2011, specifically half of the original 45 years. However, he eventually died on June 20, 2019. Meanwhile, Deal Armstrong succumbed to breast cancer on April 4, 2017 while in the midst of serving her sentence. Despite both being convicted for such an elaborate crime, the story has still left many baffled as to who the real mastermind was. Many have been convinced that it indeed was Deal Armstrong, but for some, it remains a mystery. Thank you for making it this far. If you like this video, please hit the like button and subscribe to our channel. Let us know what you think about this story in the comments below. We would love to hear from you. Once again, thank you and see you on the next one.